Thank you, Chris. So, I believe you guys have already met me, at least some of you, because in this forum I've been talking about IPv6 for almost five years. Usually I would talk either about the work of council, which actually turned five years only last week, so uh, it's quite a significant milestone for us. Um, but today I'm not here to talk about any intricacies of IPv6 deployment or talk about the work of council. Today I would like to bring to your attention a slightly different topic because I was inspired by a talk that Jen Linkova gave at our annual council meeting in December last year. And there she was talking about the common misconceptions of IPv6. Jen actually wrote a blog about it, which was published on RIPE NCC blog site. I recommend uh, for you to go and read that blog. Um, well, she made me think about why this technology really has such a hard time, because if IPv6 was really just a technical problem, the problem of missing features or applications supporting IPv6, etc., we would be looking at a slightly different graph today, because we all know that we need large addressing space, and this nothing is really making our lives really complicated. So I believe if this was really just a technical problem, we, the graph would be a simpler line, and it wouldn't be oscillating. There wouldn't be a 5% difference between weekdays, where people don't have IPv6 at work, and weekends when they do have it. And simply, that just really made me think a little bit more about the various experiences I had over about 10 years when I've been dealing with IPv6. So I just want to say here I'm going to talk about the various personalities that I've encountered while working uh, with IPv6. And I just want to say these are my observations. I hope you take it in a good humor. Well, in a very short time we will have some beer, so I'm happy to take uh, any further discussion there. And um, let's just get started. So what have I seen over the last 10 years? Let's start with my favorites. Um, IPv6 haters and trolls, anyone? You know, these are people who, no matter how positive message you give about your efforts and uh, what you say and how you try to encourage others, they will always find some flaws. They will find things that fail, they'll turn your story on the head, and they basically always find reasons why not to deploy IPv6. So I call them excuse factory. It recently happened to me that I wrote a blog, and basically some of this, these clickbait sites got hold of it, and they found the one thing which didn't work, and I shared it genuinely in that blog because I wanted others to learn from it, and basically it just escalated to a way that all of a sudden I was getting condolences emails from the internet, uh, the elders of the internet, telling me, we are so sorry your IPv6 project is not going well. I was like, what is going on? And then I found out what really happened. But really with these people, you just simply have to keep going. Um, the positive side effect that they've got is basically they just give me, and I believe everybody, the energy we just basically want to keep going and just make things work. How to deal with these people? My suggestion is simply, simply just keep on walking and let them hate. Often they also hate from IPv4 only platforms, so why should we be bothered by them? The group number two, IPv6 deniers. So these are really interesting people because often when I start a discussion with them, I realize they still live like eight years ago because they somehow never heard of Google IPv6 statistics. They don't know we are today at about 27%. They somehow managed to miss that these quite significant world IPv6 events happened day and launch in 2011 and 2012. They also don't realize that the devices they use today on day-to-day -day basis, be it Windows, Linux, um, Mac, and iOS, they actually prefer IPv6 by default, so as soon as you feed those devices a dual-stack connection, they will simply connect and use IPv6. They also never heard that Apple, about four years ago, announced that they, from iOS 10, they will enforce that all apps up submitted to the App Store will have to work in IPv6 only environment through NAT64, and if your app fails, they'll simply remove it from App Store. This can be actually quite revenue impacting. And these people also never noticed that mobile providers 
often today resort to serving data over IPv6 only networks. Here in the UK, we've got EE. Um, I'm sure that some people have heard the story that uh, Nick um, Heatley has shared at UK North in the past. So I would just say these people simply have not known usually what the facts are and what the situation is. So the positive side of them is that they actually can be convinced with data and with facts. And um, what I often actually, what the benefit that I get from them is they help me sharpen my story about IPv6 and why we need to do it. Group number three, those are people who often will say, well, I know, of course, it is very important, but please don't give me any test network. I don't have any time. I can't prioritize it. They will often passively block you. They will resist, not openly, but quietly, which is actually making the life of us IPv6 practitioners quite hard. They will never say no, especially if their boss is present in the room. And they basically always rely on the management to make the decision and prioritize. They will always ask for deadlines, milestones. And what is the business case again? Um, I would just tell that these people, the side effect they've got on, on IPv6 practitioners, they help us create roadmaps. As I tell my team internally, it's like, okay, they want a deadline, we are gonna give them a deadline. Group number four, people who will endlessly debate with you about all the possible options, how you could solve the problem. And then in the end, they will reject every single of these options because none of them is perfect. They will also try to do the big thing in one go, the big bang uh, approach, rather than start small and iterate. Um, so my experience there is that I have to remind the people that we live in a brownfield world. We are burdened with technical debt of the past and of the decisions that we had to make about future when we didn't know what the future is going to be like. My suggestion is you recommend them that they can actually realize their debating potential in the mailing list of IETF working groups. However, these people can actually be really the best pilot users, but they can provide you lots of feedback. And through those extensive debates, often you can uncover dependencies and potential problems that um, you or your team have not thought about at the beginning. Group number five, it's getting better. These people are the enthusiast supporters, people who actually go and do the deployments. They are our allies. Uh, they necessarily don't need to be really network engineers or uh, they can be application people, they can be project managers, or they can be simple users who understand, okay, there's something not right with the existing internet if we wanna grow it and not make it more broken and more complex. We really need to get on with this thing called IPv6. They participate in pilots, they provide feedback, and they actually, in their own words can help convince the unconvinced because I speak the technical language, they can speak the language of project managers, of normal users, and they really can help, you know, um, move us forward. I would say these people certainly make us IPv6 practitioners enjoy our work. The number six IPv6 heroes, that's the final group. And I would say those are people who actually have worked on, the, on IPv6 since it started. So these people have been working on this for over 20 years, or they joined more recently. However, they significantly contribute to the growth of IPv6 uh, adoption, organize the world IPv6 events. They go and endlessly educate others, their peers. They go and harass the vendors and force them to support certain features, or they actually work in the vendors and they talk to their business units that they have to support features in the equipment. They convince the management, they create the business cases. They are the ones who always ask, what about IPv6 when they are sitting in the room? And they basically battle tears of resistance. I've got immense respect for these people and I'm sure that some of these heroes are sitting in this room uh, because just how hard it is to get on with IPv6, they just uh, persevered. So I look at them as, you can look at them as supermans or superwomen, but in my opinion, they are also, um, I'm paraphrasing a certain sentence from a very popular movie these days, they are people of focus, commitment, and sheer effing will. What about us, the IPv6 practitioners? We really have to realize that when it comes to IPv6, we often can't remain and be just, for example, network engineers. I'm a network engineer by education and practice, but I have to deal with application developers. I have to deal with management, with end users. So the breadth that IPv6 exposes us to, it's, it's quite immense. 
I think everybody here understands that communication is absolutely key. For me, it's probably 50 to 60% of my job that I do. We also have to deal a lot with vendors, and my colleague Zoli is going to actually talk about it in a little while. And if you think, oh, this is really great and somebody should do it, my message is somebody is off indefinitely, you need to do it. So, to summarize, why really IPv6? You might be a small company. Uh, we heard enterprises really don't care much about IPv6. Well, uh, there might be a point in not so distant future when you need to buy a couple of public addresses somewhere because you need to open a branch or a service provider gives you a slash 29 slash 30 because they simply can't give you more than that of IPv4. It's not going to get any cheaper. Uh, I'm really... Um, very much indebted to IPv4 market group, they sometimes sponsor UK of because they publish information about the price development of IPv4. To give you, I have been watching this very closely, it's a strong business case uh, for us. Basically, 18 months ago, the price of one IPv4 was $14.50. Today, you are looking at least at $19 and more. This is not going to stop, that's not the ceiling. If you don't care about the financial reasons, well, the big internet, and uh, we also heard Office 365 earlier today, the big internet doesn't care about your small um, uh, uninterest in IPv4 because the big internet needs to do v6. They have the business case and they are moving to IPv4 as a service where v4 is becoming a legacy protocol on the internet. So if you really want to maintain a good user experience on this changing internet, which is totally out of your control, my recommendation is deploy v6. To summarize, hopefully this brief talk made you think about the human side of deploying IPv6. My recommendation is make allies and convince the unconvinced as much as possible. Your successful deployment requires both approaches. The engineering bottom-up approach hardly ever succeeds if your management is not backing you up. And final message, there is no better time to start than now because dual stack is uh, business as usual. You really don't have anything, you don't have much to worry about and uh, the price has really shifted to IPv6 only. Thank you. Questions for Veronica. Questions? Okay, thank you, Veronica.